Matt here, and welcome, Fano, to the War on News. Your weekly safe and careful on the soul and current affairs beam live from the palatial Stratus news bunker, buried deep beneath the heart of the Great Republic. If this show was cynical, it would note that when a Muslim extremist kills someone, that there is an immediate demand from the media for Muslim leaders to give a denouncement of the violence and an apology on behalf of the entire Muslim faith. When a white right-wing Christian goes on the rampage, it's he was acting on his own as a lone wolf. And tonight's political media crumbs against reason kill zone. New Zealand, SAS and Afghanistan killing in the name of right-wing Christian fundies. Hungry New Zealand children versus the Shire Volk. More white New Zealanders kill white New Zealand children than Māori kill Māori children. Don't let Cracker babysit the kids. Plus this week's Sex in the Super City and the Wanko the Week Award. Leading the war on news this week, brothers and sisters, all John Key brought back from Washington was the lousy Marines. Instead of asking hard questions about this free trade deal America wants us to sign, the free trade deal that our own negotiators were secretly caught admitting we get nothing from. The same free trade deal that allows US corporations to take the New Zealand government to court and foreign tribunals we have no power over. The mainstream media, instead of asking hard questions, decided to go all gaga over how amazing the visit was and what good friends we are with America now and how much they love us. The New Zealand embedded news journalists who flew to Washington for the junket were less critical than Libyan state news. So maybe now the trip to Disneyland are over, the mainstream media will ask those hard questions about the free trade deal now? <laughs> Not bloody likely. Today it was announced that the government had blocked a request for a select committee hearing on the implications of the proposed Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. So the media don't ask hard questions. We won't get a select committee meeting to provide oversight and ask hard questions. But don't worry, John Key gets his photo op with Obama. With media as uncritical as this, who needs an election? Brothers and sisters, news that more UK newspapers were involved in phone hacking and police bribing was announced this week. Watching Rupert squirm is one thing. The entire implosion of Fleet Street alongside the reputation of the police force is a cultural head wound on a national psyche already reeling from the political fallout of the political corruption scandals, all during one of the worst UK recessions on record. Gen X is our generation built naturally on scepticism and challenging authority, but can even they prevent an outright jaded collapse of faith in the democratic franchise when the politicians, political establishment, police and media are all smeared with the same contempt. The age of cynicism is born from a ragged master. He's going to own TVNZ soon. <laughs> To the headlines, Fano. New Zealand SAS in Afghanistan killing in the name of right-wing Christian fundies. According to John Key, New Zealand is in Afghanistan to prevent terror attacks like the one in Norway. The one in Norway was, of course, conducted by a right-wing fundy Christian. Using John's logic, shouldn't we be sending the SAS into churches and start mass arresting priests? Propping up a corrupt narco state while handing civilians over to known torture units is one thing. Holding up a domestic a terror attack by a fundy far-right Christian as our justification for continued occupation in Afghanistan is, however, an audacity too far. The only thing one can be certain of is that John Key, if re-elected, will have the promise not to resend the SAS back into Afghanistan gone before lunchtime. He has traded our independent foreign policy for slavish observance to America and its 51st state, Israel, and that's why Guy has shh, hushed up Israel harvesting New Zealand passports again because it doesn't look good to have our bedfellows openly screwing us in public again. We are not in Afghanistan to protect Norway from anti-Muslim far-right Christian nutters. He was brain farting and wanting to look relevant during the Obama press conference while the world's media was watching and made his comments before any of the facts were known. 
we are in Afghanistan because Key has traded our independent foreign policy for alliances. Moving on with the headlines, Fano. Helen Clark always used to say that New Zealand was conservative with a little c. I've always believed that we're also redneck with a little r. The one type of redneck I despise above all other Shire Volk. Those redneck, well-to-do hobbits who have a vested interest in the underlying unfairness of the system. According to Child Poverty Action Group, we have 221,000 children living beneath the poverty line and 83,000 need taxpayer funds so that they can at least get one nutritious meal a day at school. Now, if you listen to the arrogance of the Shire Volk talk about the poor and why they can't afford to feed their children a recession this steep, it's always, they buy booze, ciggies and lotto tickets instead of food. That's right. It's not the 5% inflation and a minimum wage that is a joke. Note, Act and National want to re-implement youth rates. It's not that welfare benefits are set 20% below the minimum nutritional requirements for an adult so that they are hungry for work. It's none of that. When you listen to the banality of the Shire Volk in passing judgment on the poor, you're reminded of the Herman Melville quote. Of all the preposterous assumptions of humanity over humanity, nothing exceeds most of the criticisms made on the habits of the poor by the well-housed, well-warmed and well-fed. Why should the poorest members of our society pay for an economic recession they had no hand in making? It was the Shire Volks wealth class who exhibited the corporate greed that made Wall Street a rigged casino. No beneficiaries were on the phone to their Wall Street stockbrokers in 2008 buying light crude and euros and speculating on the Goldman Sachs derivatives market. What the Shire Volk have misjudged is the egalitarian nature of New Zealanders. Kiwis accept their social obligations because because those obligations have been forged in fires far deeper than their socially conservative pockets. On the battlefields where New Zealand's honour was tested, when the rich and the poor of New Zealand stood shoulder to shoulder and held the line, where the responsibility of democracy was equally shared, so too they decided Will the fruits of that democracy be equally shared? Our redistributive tax system, that is the backbone of our egalitarianism, cannot be easily swayed by the vacant optimism of the free market that so kindles the light of the eyes of our shire volk. We see the poverty. We see the need in our fellow citizen, and we see the corporate welfare that is replaced, social welfare. Finding $20 million when this government has handed out billions in corporate welfare to feed the poorest New Zealand children is a necessity. Now, refusing to do so because the Shire Volk believe it isn't the state's responsibility to feed the poor is ethically bankrupt. Moving on with the headlines, finite. So it turns out research shows 50% of kids die at the hands of white New Zealanders, yet the overwhelming media attention and myopic ratings focused presentation of the gruesome details is always on the 30% that are Māori. You know a news producer's mouth waters when he gets a story of young Māori youth breaking into an old war hero's home and beating him up. Stereotypes that concur with a base recognition in the ignorant rates better by playing to the worst angels of our nature than a reasoned approach to news gathering. Our public broadcasters should be resisting this easy race baiting rather than reinforcing it. In 1984, 40% of the news on TVNZ was politics. After the viewer as consumer restructuring, that had fallen by 1996 to only 20%, with the other 20% now crime stories. If it bleeds, it leads because shock stories about crime gain ratings. Paula Bennett was quick to drag the issue back to Dem Marys once this research came out and pointed out Māori was still overrepresented. While Māori make up 14% of the population and are reflected a staggering 30% in abuse cases, making them overrepresented, in terms of sheer numbers, in terms of pure size, white people murder their children many times more than Māori. The reason there are more white people hurting children is because more white people are impacted by poverty and the stresses that poverty creates. By constantly blaming Māori for child abuse, it ignores that real generators of domestic abuse that poverty contributes to. The casual racist presumption that a broadcast is the everyday on the mainstream media should be endlessly challenged 
and never accepted. But are you feeling sexy? It's sex in the super city time. want to be the I told you so guy, but who would I be kidding? I love being that guy. Has anyone else noticed some ominous canaries dying in many cages over at the Rugby World Cup? Put aside the petty council vandalism of the inner city, the K-Road assault alleyways, the spike in sexual attacks, the extra powers given to police misused on Mana Party and Unite Union members, the private security firm with the $20,000 contract to twice daily sweep the homeless from Queen Street so as not to offend the tourists, the expensive cloud tent no one wants after the Rugby World Cup. Put all that to one side. I'm just talking about the ticket sales. This matters not because of our weird fetish for rugby. It matters because according to Treasury, the Rugby World Cup alongside the Christchurch rebuild will be the two main economic drivers of this year. Did I say two main? I meant two only drivers this year. Uh, now, one doesn't need to be Ken Ring to predict that the Christchurch rebuild won't really start this side of December. So that leaves the Rugby World Cup. And in terms of that, aren't the signs kind of ominous that the entire thing will become one giant fizzer? And are the media ignoring these warning signs because they have so much sponsorship riding on this with advertisers as well? Let's just look at the last couple of weeks. The Eden Park luxury uber expensive penthouse suite extension at the posh part of the park was dramatically scaled back from a double story to a single story after a complete lack of interest in pre-bookings. This elite part of the clientele is supposed to be the profit margins for these events and to date the uber rich ain't coming. This is borne out by the collapse last week of a local business set up with rugby legends of old as front men to hire exclusive homes out to these same class of rugby spectators. Add the appalling ticket sales to date alongside news today that cheaper seats are being released because tour operators can't sell them and increasingly it's looking less and less likely that the Rugby World Cup is going to be the vast money maker treasury were hoping like hell it would be. At some point organisers are going to just have to accept that this is nose diving and offer free Rugby World Cup ticket. So if you're keen on going, hold out. I think Rugby World Cup ticket prices are the only thing this year, price wise, that will definitely be coming down. Fine, now let's wrap the show with this week's Wanko the Week Award. This week's Wanko the Week, brothers and sisters, has to go to Māori Party MP to Uraroa Flavel for suggesting the way to deal to suicide was to dishonour them in death by burying them in a separate cemetery. I know. Cue shock look now. Our suicide rate tripled during the 1990s as the hard right economic policy and social policy agenda was implemented. Unemployment jumped to over 20% for youth in 1992 and it's now over 19% in 2011. What makes Flavel's comments so outrageous is that it is the policies of the government he supports that is generating the hopelessness that feeds suicide. Flavel asks what else can be done rather than damn those who are weak and who fall and dishonour them in death? Why not implement policy to strengthen the social infrastructure that can cope with these social stresses? How about you spend those billions you've handed over in corporate welfare to the people that actually need it instead? Flavel would have John Kerwin say, rather than talk about your depression, know that we will piss on your graves and spit on your name once you are dead. Flavel shows all the bedside manner of Pontius Pilate trying to wash away the social carnage of his government's decisions. The insensitivity combined with the audacity makes Flavel a political suicide for wanting to dishonour suicide victims. Now that's irony. That's it for tonight, folks. Don't forget Citizen A plays Friday, 8pm, Freeview 21 and Sky 89. Follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter and Facebook site. It has all the shows posted up online and allows you to befriend other like-minded citizens for romantic news moments. Good night, New Zealand. You stay classy, Aotearoa. Righto.